once again we are having our discussion we call attempted intelligence where we're not only modeling conversations where we're attempting to learn share information and improve our understanding uh, but also you know just generally what that looks like especially when one of us may have more information than the other or have an alternate insight because if you have an alternate insight as opposed to the insights that I have then I'm able to integrate that to some degree either to think you're dumb and an asshole or to be like well that's awesome mm -hmm. but I'm not going to tell them <laughs> right? or maybe like just you know what I actually do is like awesome thank you yeah right? that's what I actually do right. but the other ones were just snarky so there you go <laughs> so the thing to do here or that I'm going to attempt to do is walk through the process of creating experimentation and how that would re experimentation to observe a phenomenon and then make some inference or uh, essentially evaluate the data that is generated from that experiment so to do that I would like to relate it to things we've talked about before with respect to epistemologies. Right? So constructivism being multiple truths entirely dependent on the observer, the environment of observation and previous experience, previous experience of the observer. Positivism being the other end of that spectrum, essentially suggesting that there's one reality regardless of observer then post-positivism saying they believe there's one reality that can be identified however the observer does impact that to some degree so it's somewhere in between positivism and constructivism so i was just asking about this uh, off camera but as well the post positives is it more so they just recognize that the observer is a factor when they're they, it's not simply recognition okay. it's built into how they view things okay right so essentially it's the uh, a simple observation that even in positivist situations where you're looking for one reality and you're doing everything you can in your design to decontextualize, right? So you're not necessarily having only one person collect data or any people collect data. It just goes into some form of database. You're trying to decontextualize it as much as you're able to, but the post-positivist would say, well, the researcher influences the decision at least to some degree, they influence the interpretation, things of that nature. Okay, right. So, And also, they will maybe take it from different angles, right? They may not just take one angle on the question, right. they may take different angles on the question to see if it's more robust, okay. right? The, a positivist is going to try to make something, or try to identify when something is robust or when something is weak to the best of their capacity. Right. They're just doing everything they can to remove the individuals Whereas the post-positivist says the individuals have some play, right? right? So it's, it's essentially a recognition, but it does influence methods and, and things. And like just that. factoring that in. Yeah. yeah. So to begin scientific investigation or experimentation, or even forming an opinion, right? So we can maybe even couch this in the ability to form an opinion on something, okay. right? So there's something that's controversial out in the world and somebody throws it at you and you're like, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, I'm on board. Right. Or you say, hold on a second. Okay, I know this looks like this thing. I wanna be sure, okay? So you need to begin with a hypothesis, right? A hypothesis is essentially a prediction, right? right? Based on these things, this should be the outcome. Okay. If these things are all true, the outcome should be this, right. right? Then you have to have your null hypothesis, which is if we run this experiment, we should see these things. If we do not see these things, this hypothesis is null. So during the process, we should see these things? Yes, yeah. well, the, the outcome of the protocol, mm -hmm. right? So if, I don't know, if Pierce Brosnan was James Bond, I should be able to find not only recordings of Bond movies with Pierce Brosnan in them and no clear-cut evidence that it's somebody dressed as Pierce Brosnan, right? right. right? Aside from stunt sequences, right. which are fine, and then I should be able to find no evidence of Pierce Brosnan saying he didn't play Bond. Okay. Right. So if I find any evidence, if I run that experiment and I go find everything about James Bond, and I see Pierce Brosnan, I see Pierce Brosnan doing uh, interviews about Goldeneye right. and talking about Halle Berry and Halle Berry in the same room as Pierce Brosnan doing, right. like all of these things, it just amounts to okay. 
I, I predicted Pierce Brosnan was James Bond. I have enough evidence that Pierce Brosnan was James Bond. I don't know why that's the thing that came to my head, <laughs> but if there was any evidence saying that, no, there was somebody dressed as Pierce Brosnan, right. then it's like, okay, well, it's no, right? right? The prediction didn't hold. Right. I predicted Pierce Brosnan was James Bond. Right. There we go, right? right? So you have your hypothesis. Your hypothesis is predicting outcomes based on other information, right? Now, what I would say is to generate your hypothesis, you need previous information. So it depends on what you already know, your angle of observation, and your previous experiences. So whether I know whether I know Pierce Brosnan and whether I know about James Bond as the character. Yeah, though in, in that particular case, right. sure. Like th those things, it requires those things. Right. Which epistemology would that suit best, or would best describe that process? Relying on the previous information that you have, your angles of observation, things like that. Um, that would be constructivist. Constructivism, yeah. So essentially, hypothesis generation does depend on the individual and previous experience. So even if you're doing a positivist experiment, right. the initial portion would best be described by a constructivist epistemology. Yeah. It's got to start <clears throat> somewhere. That may be why the post-positivist says, hey, this does depend on us to some degree. The positivist would say, yeah, it does, but during the experimental protocol, right. I try to take myself out of the best of my ability. So, you have your prediction. To test your prediction, you have to de develop a protocol that has the chance to prove you wrong. Okay. Right? To figure out if James Bond, in fact, or Pierce Brosnan was in fact, or in fact played James Bond. I was going to say the wording because I was like, yeah. you're not going to find yeah. if he's James Bond if yeah. he actually is James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> well, so yeah, you, if you played James Bond, yeah, yeah. you have to go out and assay bond materials those would come in so you have to essentially look at all of the bond movies right to identify if in fact he was there if in fact he was credited you can't stay there you also have to assay uh, promotional materials right you have to look at all of those right. things and so your prediction is if i look at all of the bond material i'm able to find i should also find pierce brosnan right if he played bond Right? So there should be some continuity between the actual films that he did appear in, as well as the promotional materials. Right? There should be some continuity. Right. Right? The, he should, there should be some similarity in, in visual, possibly a different voice. However, in this case, because his accent did not require to change much, if anything at all, he has a fairly soft accent. If I remember properly, he is Irish, okay. uh, but his accent is fairly soft, so it's not going to be strange for somebody with a soft Irish accent to be in Her Majesty's Secret Service, right, as a double O. So, you know, you, you, again, you predict that if you assay all bond material, films, and promotional material, you should find evidence that Pierce Brosnan is there. Right. If you do not find evidence to support that, then it's the null hypothesis Pierce Brosnan was not ever playing James Bond. Right. Right? So, now, here's the thing. When you do that, it can't just be because you said so when you watched. <laughs> Especially if you're trying to develop a, an experimental protocol that will stand up to rigor. Whether it's constructivist or not. So constructivists, when they're running protocols, when they're running uh, even data collection, they'll have multiple people and they'll do what's called a reflexivity statement. So they actually state their preferences and their biases and their angles to say, I am this researcher, this is my name, these are the things I'm interested in, oh, therefore, you know, these are the <clears throat> things, my subjectivity is actually going to influence what I find, right? right? But then what you do is you have multiple researchers, right. so they're looking for crossover. Right. So what you do is you have what's called a state, say you create your data set, like you go out and check all the bond material as a constructivist, and you know, every time Pierce Brosnan pops up, you're like Pierce Brosnan, right? And you end up finding the patterns, right? Because right? you're like, not Pierce Brosnan. Well, is it is the code? So it's called coding, right? You can code not Pierce Brosnan, not Pierce Brosnan, not Pierce Brosnan. So Sean Connery is not Pierce Brosnan. Uh, Roger Daltrey, right. Dal Dalton, Daltrey. Right. Oh, you know, I, yeah, yeah, Dalton, I, Daltrey, whatever. Yeah. yeah. For some reason, I thought it was Roger Moore. But yeah. Moore. There we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, the uh, Roger Moore. Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig. Right. Uh, whomsoever may come after, right. they could all be coded as not James Bond. Right. However, if you coded them all as not James Bond and you brought that to me, I'd be like, dude, 
Roger Moore, Sean Connery, we need some, we need to recode. Right. So we have to come to some form of agreement. So even in a constructivist situation, there has to be some effort to have agreement between more than one individual, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just because it's you, it's tougher to buy that. Right. Because ideally somebody else should be able to replicate it. Right. Even if it's constructivist, right? So constructivists are fine with re retaining the subjectivity, right? And retaining the context of the individuals who did the research, whereas a positivist would try to decontextualize it and say, no matter who looks at this, this is what they should find. I was going to say, whether it's you, me, or someone else that's yeah. researching these movies, yes. they, they should be yeah. able to find Now, yeah. in order to remove some of those subjective problems, ideally, if I'm the one that created the experimental protocol, I shouldn't be doing much of that work. Okay. Ideally. So I generated it. And if my prediction holds true, you should be able to find what I predict. Right. And then somebody else that I assign with you should be able to find what I predict. Right. Not always the easiest thing to do, depending on your resources, your time, the expertise of the individuals that you would require, depending on the protocol. It does become tougher. Right. But essentially, you would like to see a situation whereby the person who made the prediction is doing less of that work, if it's positivist. If it's constructive, it's not that big a deal. You state your reflex of positions or your subject of positions, and then people understand. But you still have to say, we checked this against each other and came to consensus. Right. Right. So if other people did it, ideally they should, they may not come, it's not, you don't expect that they'll come to the same consensus, but something should happen. When you cross-reference, is that more post positivist No. No? No, it's constructivist too. It's still okay. Yeah, yeah. post positivist will run positivist experiments. Okay. Sometimes it'll be constructive stuff, depends on the situation. Well, just because you were factoring in um, the individual observer and then yeah. um, looking for that crossover, that similarity. That, not so much as far as experimental design. Post-positivist experimental designs will often look like positivist designs. Okay. Right, that's just what they look like. But essentially, you're looking at in the actual experimental stage to create a situation whereby I'm trying to prove my prediction wrong, because you don't try to prove your prediction right, you try to prove it wrong. You have to create something that would, if you run it and you are wrong, it can show. Okay. Right? That said, constructivism isn't built so much that way. You're just assaying it and finding the themes right. and having more than one person agree on those themes. Uh, so your input's in there, my input's in there, and it's gumbo. Right. Right? Whatever. So attempting to have it robust enough that more than one individual could agree, right? Or in the case of a positive situation, the person who made the prediction isn't doing much of the work such that anybody could find the prediction right. or multiple people could find the prediction and then you would su I suspect if you gave it to other people they could replicate it. Right. You can't always. Right? And that's why it is difficult to say that there is one reality. Right. It, but it's also difficult to say that there's many. Right? So there's difficulties with all. Right. So you go, you run your experimental protocol, you collect your data, then you're looking at your data. Right? When you're looking at your data, the person who's looking at the data or the people who are looking at the data are the people that maybe made the prediction. I was going to say, is it the original person that made the prediction? Often, sometimes yes, sometimes no, it depends on the, on the protocol, but their, their influence exists. Right. But they're trying to decontextualize the, to some degree the interpretation of that data, right? whether it's a constructivist trying to get some form of consensus between researchers, or a positivist trying to decontextualize it. You're trying to get some consensus, but those people are there. They exist, they're real, they do have influence. You can run a preferential, like you might run stats that you like, and then somebody says, well, why didn't you run these stats? Then you have some rationale, right. but because you have some rationale for why you didn't run it, it, you know, it's your axiology, it's your values, it's your preferences. So then you have that mix at data interpretation, right? So the mix of the actual people who exist, who are part of the process, their values, even if they're trying to decontextualize it, what epistemology or theory of knowledge or theory of knowledge creation or theory of truth does that best fit for? That'd be post positives Yes, because the influences are there, but you're, you may be trying to decontextualize it, create a situation where it can be replicated at least to some degree. Right. Right. So not anybody who's other than Pierce Brosnan is, you remember the show Dinosaurs? Not the mama. <laughs> it's no, no. That's dad right. and mom. Right. No, no. That's mama. Not the mama. Right. right. So it's not. If it's not Pierce Brosnan, that doesn't mean it's not Pierce Brosnan. Right. 
It's like they have names too, <laughs> even if I don't remember Roger Moore's name <laughs> properly in, the, in this moment. But you know, uh, Sean Connery, mm -hmm. Daniel Craig. Right? Yeah. You've got you've got other Bonds. Yeah. Uh, there was one guy who wasn't he Bond for one movie. Yeah, but I don't remember him. That's fair. Enough. Well, you remember him. <laughs> yeah. It's not his name right now. Right, right. I believe he had blue eyes. I think so. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there was a train in that movie. If I remember right. Again, who knows? Yeah. Right. Remember, fickle. But the idea of being in this conversation to show that even if you're running a positivist experiment, the steps that you must take will be better described by other epistemologies. So even if you, your central paradigm is a positivist paradigm, you almost have no choice but to behave in a way that is better described by other paradigms. I'm just wondering if you removed the, the observer out of the part, any part of the, the process and you replaced it with a computer, was it still problematic because the person created the, the you have to put the program in, yeah. Right, so there's, so that, that there's an interaction at some point. You can say that the person who programmed uh, super intelligent AI that learns on its own, right. it's, you know, it, there's a flaw because of the original programmer. Right. right? The, the, the argument, unfortunately, doesn't seem to have a clear end point. That's why I would usually call epistemology as a spectrum, okay. because there's going to be crossovers at right. some point. The, the, I think the point is, Let's just say you're trying to form an opinion on Bond actors, uh, like who did it, yeah. even though that's not necessarily an emotional opinion or anything. It's like, well, there's just some things that we could call obligate reality that there's not much choice in. Right. But then you'd be like, Hollywood magic, it wasn't him. <laughs> <laughs> it was a robot. Right, right. right? You're like, well, we didn't have robot technology, so now you have to do all this other search. Right? Right. But the idea is that even to do that, to say you have to have the knowledge that James Bond is a character, right. that James Bond movies have been made, that it has not always been the same actor, yep. and that one of those actors may or may not have been Pierce Brosnan. You need that previous information, so that depends on you. If you don't have those pieces of information, why would you ask the question? I was going to say, you wouldn't come up. You wouldn't ask the question, right? So if somebody's like, Pierce Brosnan was never a Bond, I'm like, well, let's figure it out. Yeah. Right? Then you got to go figure it out. The So that's constructive. So Pierce Brosnan never... Well, I'm just going to jump mm -hmm. um, ahead, but Pierce Brosnan's never been Bond. That's actually the positive, positivist idea, like the next step. And so the positivist move is to say, well, either he has or he hasn't. I oh. predict that he has, but to for me to prove that he has, well, not even prove that he has, you got to be careful. For me to be confident that Pierce Brosnan has played James Bond, I have to set up an experiment that would prove that Attempt. would be able to yeah. prove that he hadn't. Right. So I have to look at all the bond material. Right. Right. I have to set something up to prove that he hadn't. Right. Right. I can't just say, see, somebody on Google, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> fate, you know, Starface one five seven says he definitely has been. I, like I can't rely on that. I need more robust data collection. Right, right. I need to assay the actual source material to the best of my ability, not the opinions. Right. right? So I have to know where to look. Right. But I have to set up a protocol that would be able to show if he had been or he hadn't been. Right. Right? Because then I would prove the null hypothesis if he hadn't been. And then I would if if he has been, I gain confidence in my hypothesis right. as a prediction. Right. If my hypothesis withstands multiple experiments that could prove it wrong. And there's essentially no way to create another experiment to prove it wrong. It becomes a theory. Oh, okay. Right. A theory is as close to describing reality in a predictive way as you can possibly get. Okay. There are a lot of things that are called theories that are hypotheses. They are not theories because they have not withstood rigor. They have not withstood experimentation to attempt to prove them wrong. Right. If they have been, if somebody has attempted to prove them wrong and they have been proven wrong. And they still say it's my theory. It's like, no, it can't be. <laughs> You're misusing that term. Right. A lot of people misuse the terms. Some people like to take control of language and say, you know, it's my language and I control it. I'm like, well, whatever, backslider. <laughs> okay. It's like, you know, the, uh, when I was younger, I was in grade nine and I had, there was a friend, and as a joke, he was like, I've put a curse on you. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, you can no longer speak Swahili. Like, I never could speak Swahili, see? It worked. Mm -hmm. like, 
right? So you're in one of those positions where it's actually, that can't be proven wrong. Right. Because if I had memory of being able to speak Swahili at any point, then his curse didn't work. Right. Right. Like, and there's just literally, he, you create a situation where there's, there's no way to prove you wrong. Right. It doesn't mean you're right, but there's no way to prove mm -hmm. you wrong. So then I'm just going to say, okay, I'm going to go away. <laughs> but yeah, the, if you're trying to form an, an understanding of something, then you're coming from a constructivist place to start yeah. to make a hypothesis that would predict something, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like we just stick with Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan's been bond. No, he hasn't. Okay. Yeah. Let's go check some information. And then, you know, you both Google, right? And you pick different things. You look at the same article and then you interpret it different ways. Right. It's like, okay, well that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that when you're trying to understand something, you're better off to try to look in a way, look at information in a way that could prove your prediction wrong, okay. right? Not to prove your prediction right. right, that could, could prove your prediction wrong. Right. So sometimes you have to do multiple searches on Google. And you said that gives you more confidence that, that your prediction is correct. If, it, if the search or searches that you do of the information available do not prove you wrong. Right. Right? So it's, a, it's kind of a weird construction as far as how to say it. Right, right. But I need to look in a way that could prove me wrong. And if I don't get proven, if my prediction isn't proven wrong, I have more confidence that I'm correct. It's almost along with the lines that you say the, um, the reasonable amount of doubt. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because if you're looking up something to... Appropriate amount of uncertainty. Pro appropriate amount of uncertainty. Yeah. But if you're looking up something to prove yourself mm -hmm. wrong, then you're accepting the fact that you are uncertain. Yeah. And you can be more confident that your, your prediction is correct mm -hmm. the less you find to disprove you. Yeah. Now, I will say that that's uh, not seemingly a common way to go about understanding the world. Mm -hmm. So I understand that most people don't want to do it or will feel very uncomfortable doing it or it's not worth their time in their estimation. I have no issues with that. What I will say is that if you're extremely confident and you've gone about trying to prove yourself correct most of your life, I will have a very quick amount of a, a very very in a, in a very short order, I will be very unlikely to believe you about most things. Right. right. If I can tell that you're just trying to prove yourself right through most thing, most of your actions, right. and when somebody pr presents you with dissenting information, you don't take it on really quickly as an individual. I'm gonna be like, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and not believe most of what you say no. until I have some form of reason otherwise. Right. right. Now, in saying that, you could say, well, Sam, that's confirmation. Right? I'm like, I'm, I'm observing the data and I'm interpreting it. This person goes about trying to prove himself correct, right? And that's the data that I'm seeing. I have high degrees of confidence that they try to prove themselves correct, yeah. right? I, what I should do is, you know, okay, I, my prediction is that they try to prove themselves right all the time. I should look for evidence that, you know, right. that I'm incorrect. That's false, yeah. uh, so essentially the way that I do that is the lo in the longer arc of my interface with them. If I do identify evidence that they do try to prove themselves wrong or they go, they're not just always trying to prove themselves right. I don't know if you've seen me in situations where I maybe don't have a high opinion of somebody, but when a certain topic comes up and they're actually good at it, I'm like, no, no, I'll give it to, I'll give that to them. I've seen you do that. Yeah. It's like, no, they're very good at that at the same time as they're a douchebag. Right. right? <laughs> I, 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 as an individual, tend to do that. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily sway my opinion of the person as a whole, but you know, credit where credit's due. Right. Right. So, when you're trying to understand the world, you are you are more believable if you, when you try to search for information, you do so in a way that could pr could prove your prediction wrong. I'm not saying that everybody's going to do it. I'm not saying that. It feels natural or comfortable. I'm saying it probably feels very uncomfortable. Not a common thing to do, not a normal thing to do, not the first place to go. Right. Which is why science as a method is so powerful because it allows you to kind of get around to some degree the mistakes that you don't know you're making. Right. Now there are going to be some mistakes that you don't know you're making that you're going to make, but it's built in a way 
the overarching scientific approach. I won't say scientific method, because there are many methods that fall under that umbrella, as guided by epistemology, ontology, and axiology, right? which are terms we've discussed before. But it's a methodology that allows you to shortcut some of that to at least some degree. Right. And then as we continue to go about trying to prove our predictions incorrect or creating ways to test our predictions that could prove them incorrect, those things that are incorrect do fall off over time. Right. They might take 100 years to fall off because we need to develop the ability to detect things, right? right? Either cognitively or with extra sensory perception, right? So I say extra sensory perception and people are like, what do you mean? Do you mean like clairvoyance? I'm like, no. <laughs> radar guns are extra sensory perception. Right. The radar gun can accurately calculate the speed of an approaching object, turns it into a visual readout, which is a sense that I can perceive. Right. right? <laughs> so that's why I say it that way. No, that's fine. So, <laughs> anything to add to that discussion? Anything it highlights for you of interest? Um, the radar gun actually turned me off. I had a question and then the radar gun. That's okay. <laughs> But uh, more so just going with the, the idea that trying to prove yourself wrong has more significance than trying to prove yourself right. Mm -hmm. Because as you try to prove yourself wrong, it's almost as if you're, you're purposefully and consciously knocking things off rather than trying to pick the first thing that matches mm -hmm. what yeah. uh, validates your, yeah. your opinion. And I just, I like that idea that if we go about um, looking at observations and trying to find or understand more truths about the world, and we try to prove things... Just careful with the word truth. Okay. Um, observable reality. Ob observable reality. Consistently, consistent, stable, observable. Consti consistent, stable, reality. Observable. Observable realities. Yeah. Um, we, we knock off the things that don't don't work, don't... They're um, not consistent and stable. They're, they're not consistent, yeah. Um, and I just like that in the sense that we're just grasping on to things that work and then mm -hmm. we stop looking at the rest yeah. of the information. The, uh, uh, the best way to say it is it tends to be more comprehensive if you work that way. Because you have to assay more things. Right. Right, so as a tactician, you're saying, I need to be aware of all of those things that could cut me down. Yeah. Right? If I'm aware of the things that can cut me down and I test myself against them and they cannot cut me down, those things cannot cut me down. Right. Is there something that could cut me down? It's possible. I haven't found it yet. Right. Right. So it's almost like you're, almost looking, like you're, looking, for you're looking for the opponent that would beat you. Right. Right. Now, obviously, it's not going to work that way all the time. Right. It's just not. Right. Let's just say you are actually in a, in a situation where you competitively fight. Right. You're not picking, trying to pick opponents that will be you, right. right? However, I think if you watch fight sports, or if you watch fight sports especially, and you see somebody who will take an opponent regardless of whether or not they can win, right. they'll just take them, and sometimes they win, sometimes they don't. Right. Most people will immediately just call that person a warrior. It's like that guy's tough, <laughs> or that that girl just takes on anybody right. and is you know gracious in victory and defeat. That's right. That's the warrior, right? right? They would classify that way. But then the people who have these perfect records, and you can tell they fought a bunch of tomato cans, they're like, oh, they protected the record. It's right. so like, they were smart to protect the record, and then if you protect the record, you make more money. You're right. a better draw, this right. that. Because people want to see you get beat. Right. Yeah, but essentially, what you're going to do is say, I need to find, I predict that this could cut me down. Let's mm -hmm. test. Yeah. And you just keep looking for that. Yeah, you keep yeah. looking for it. Yeah. It's more comprehensive in that sense, which is why it has the value outside of the individual. Right? So, yeah. Sound good? Kind of good. All right, man. Huzzah! <laughs>